Hello everyone, it's good to be with you today. I hope that you're doing very, very well. So this morning, this afternoon, this evening, tonight, whenever you are watching this, we're gonna have a look at the rapture. One of the most seminal and incredible events referenced in the Bible. And it will ultimately be one of the most transformative world events of all time. And uh, one way or another, we are going to be part of it, which is super, super exciting, whether alive or dead. So the rapture is supposed to be something that brings the body of Christ so much excitement, so much thrill, so much joy. It actually has brought the body of Christ a lot of confusion. So today, hopefully by the end of it, you will not be confused, but instead will have deep, deep peace and even excitement about that absolutely incredible day. So sometimes people get a little bit confused because the rapture is described as a resurrection in the Bible, but there are a lot of resurrections in the Bible. Um, when referring to prophetic um, big event resurrections, agricultural references are used a lot. So for instance, we have the resurrection of life, um, which is in three separate harvests. You have the harvest of the first fruits, which is referenced in Leviticus 29, 9 to 10. That's the resurrection of Jesus, the first of the first fruits, like in Psalm 16, 10 and 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23. But, you know, right behind Jesus, <laughs> came additional first fruits, which were Jewish saints buried around Jerusalem who also walked out of their graves after Jesus came back on the third day, which you can read about in Matthew 27, 51 to 53. When he died, their graves were opened. After he rose again, he brought them back with him. Then you have the main harvest. The main harvest is what concerns us. It's the resurrection of the body of Christ. The resurrection of the dead, right up into the sky. And the snatching up of the living, right up into the sky. Where physical bodies get remade, or refashioned, rejuvenated, regenerated, totally and utterly redeemed, perfected, restored. No fat people in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't mean fatties are exempt. It means you're not fat when you're there. So your physical body will be 100% healthy forever. Amen. So that gets caught up into the clouds. It was a mystery, a secret, something that God had only revealed to the Apostle Paul and nobody before him. You can read about it in 1 Corinthians 15, 23, as well as verses 52 to 53. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, 2 Thessalonians 1, 1, 6. Now there is another resurrection which takes place after this, um, at the very start of the Millennial Kingdom, but we're going to look at that one when we get there, okay? For the um, great seminal prophetic events that we are awaiting, which is the rapture, takes place in a few stages. Part one, Jesus' resurrection had to come first, and it did. So tick, gold star, done and dusted. The next thing is going to be God himself, the Father, blowing a trumpet. Okay, you see this in 1 Corinthians 15, 52. That's called the last trumpet of the body of Christ. God blows that trumpet, and next thing, Jesus comes down to the sky, not the earth, to the sky, with an archangel voice. He shouts something. <laughs> Maybe come, or arise, or be resurrected, my body, my kids, whatever it's going to be. And we get caught up. Christians who are dead, their soul and spirit's already in heaven. When we die, our soul and spirit's going straight to heaven. But at that archangel voice call and that trumpet call, those who are dead, their bones, 
um, their bodies, their organs, that are all going to get reformed straight away. And they're going to meet Jesus in the clouds, because we're heavenly people, so our resurrection is a heavenly one. And he's going to take it up into the sky. And those who are in heaven, their souls and spirits, are and suddenly going to be walking and talking in those physical bodies. Resurrection bodies. And, you know, you see what Jesus' body can do after the resurrection. Walking through walls. They're, they're intangible, like shadow cat of the X-Men. They can appear and disappear. Teleportation. It's going to be super. And we'll be doing that in heaven. Sorry, it's my phone. This is becoming like a bit of a... <laughs> A bit of a trend whenever I say something amazing, it's like a demon shooting at me. It's just a very distinctive uh, text tone. Then those around the earth are going to get caught up in the very, very same way. All this happens in the twinkling of an eye. It's going to be phenomenal. So our perished or perishable bodies, utterly imperishable forever, evermore. It's going to be amazing. Absolutely. Gas, Greg. At some point, then the Great Tribulation is going to kick off. Not necessarily the same day, but I imagine there will be a gap for as many as 40 years. I think we saw during COVID that the world can turn on a dime in just a day. But I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, if the devil gives people time to forget we ever existed. And after the Great Tribulation, which will last seven years from whenever it starts, um, then Jesus will come back. And uh, he will rule and reign on the earth. And uh, those who die during the Great Tribulation will be resurrected bodily. Those who lived under the gospel of kingdom, uh, the gospel of the kingdom during Jesus' earthly years and the years of the Twelve will be brought back and Old Testament saints as well. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Okay, so the harvest of gleanings and of corners, that's Leviticus 19, 9 to 10. This is what you really see during the Great Tribulation. So it's not our main focus today, I'll just mention it in passing. You are going to have a resurrection at the halfway point of the Great Tribulation. There are two witnesses, Elijah and Enoch, um, who have never died before, but all people have to die because of Adam's sin. Romans 5, 12. And uh, yeah, read Revelation 11, 9 to 13 and find out about their adventures. The Antichrist kills them. But uh, three days later, the Lord will bring them back and just resurrect them as well. At the end of the Great Tribulation, at the start of the Millennial Kingdom, he's going to resurrect Old Testament believers Job was probably running around the earth soon after Noah. Even he knew this back in chapter 19, 25 to 26. Daniel records in chapter 12, 1 to 2 and 11 to 13. Isaiah records this in chapter 26, 19 to 21. It is one of the most prophesied events in the Bible. And then the tribulation believers also get brought back such as in Revelation 20, 4 to 5. And at the end of the Great Tribulation, <laughs> yikes, even the wicked will be brought back, but uh, they will be resurrected onto condemnation. They'll be resurrected so that they can have their day in court, and then they'll be thrown into the lake of fire. And that's John 5, 28 to 29, and Revelation 20, 11 to 15. Serious yowza, yikes. Okay, but thankfully we live under the age of grace. <laughs> so we will not have any part in any of uh, uh, any of that. The harvest of gleanings and corners? No. We'll be in heaven for all of that. Looking at it from a, a heavenly perspective, an aerial view, or not at all. Just living our best lives. So the age of grace believer is safe from the end times judgment. The moment he or she first puts their faith in the gospel of Jesus. Isn't that just amazing? We can prove this by looking at Romans 8, 9 to 11. I'm going to highlight the specific parts here. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. So that's your corpse being reanimated. Or if you're alive on the earth and the rapture happens, I don't think any of us will be, but if you are, 
your perishable body becoming imperishable. Because your spirit is already fully alive in Christ. Holy Spirit lives there. Your soul is getting sanctified, remade day by day. And when you see Christ, you'll be made like him. When you step out of this mortal coil, when you die, you're instantly perfected there. No more trauma, no more sin, no more giving in to temptation. No more revenge or regret. No more unforgiveness. But the Lord doesn't want two-part people. He made tripartite humans, body, soul, and spirit. So he wants to save the body as well. That's why the rapture happens. So the that we can truly say the death has lost its sting. Okay, Romans 8, 22 to 25. You're going to notice Paul wrote all these. <laughs> he refers to the redemption of our bodies. Um, but if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So again, it's a future resurrection, a future salvation, if you will, a future redemption. It's what theologians call our glorification. Salvation is when our spirit gets saved. Sanctification is him cleaning out our soul of all of its issues, which is made perfect when we die. And our body getting uh, perfected as a glorification because we talk about Jesus' glorified resurrection body. 1 Corinthians 1 8 on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. And look what it says He'll keep you strong to the end so that you'll be free from all blame. Amen. Amen. So again, he's coming back for the body of Christ. Okay, 1 Corinthians 5 5. Hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. This was a very randy young man who was having uh, sex with his, I hope to God, stepmother. Um, and the Apostle Paul prayed that Satan would kill him because his spirit was alive. His soul was confused. <laughs> <laughs> and wounded for having made terrible decisions and dishonoring his father and almost causing a church split, if you can imagine. The church didn't know if it was better for him to be with this woman or, you know, her husband. Nonsense. Maybe there was a big age gap. Um, and yeah, Paul was like, listen, at least if he, he could die a stupid Christian or he could die a full-on sinner. <laughs> so it's a, it's a pretty out there prayer. Don't pray it over just anybody, but you know, that you might find time to pray that on occasion. Okay, First Corinthians 15, 51 to 53. Listen, I tell you a mystery, a secret that no other apostle wrote about in the Bible. We will not all sleep, so we won't all die, but we will all be changed, glorified, resurrected, given a superior body. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. So the Lord needs to remake your body if you, at the body of Christ, are to live in heaven. 2 Corinthians 1, 12 to 14 ends with, we will boast of you in the day of the Lord Jesus. Why would the body of Christ who are dead be boasting with you? Because that's the day you also go there. <laughs> okay, it's in point, you know. Uh, if you're still on the earth in those days. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven. On the day of the rapture, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. Boom. Anybody who tells you that we are going to be here for the end times, that verse disproves it. We will be raptured so that we will not be here for those times. Okay, First Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18. Another good one. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, the Father. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. I find it very hard to read that without smiling. I feel very encouraged. I hope you do too. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 to 8 says, But you Thessalonians, you Gentiles, you Irish, you everybody else, aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters. And you won't be surprised for the day the Lord comes upon you. Sadly, a lot of people will be surprised um, because they sit under terrible teaching, like a thief. But you are all chosen the light of the day. We don't belong to darkness and night. So be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. The salvation of your spirit, your soul, and your body. But sadly, we've, I mean, that's an incredible prayer. Wow, 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 wow. And instruction. But sadly, we've got a lot of Christians who do not live in the confidence of their salvation. They live in fear of that day that they're going to miss out because they don't think that they're good enough because they don't realize that their goodness comes from Jesus Christ and the cross. Or they think it's some religious burden that they have to carry. Um, but the thing with religion is you're always more religious than the person you dislike, <laughs> you know? However good or bad you are, well, there's always someone worse than me. But the opposite is true as well. There's always someone who's outworking of their, their walk or their journey is better than you. So it's a very, very precarious place to live in. And when you're stuck in that, in your, in your mind, it's, it's, a, it's a wretchedly uh, dire place. The cross is sufficient, people. Write that down. Breathe in your mirror and inscribe it. Write it on sheets of paper and stick it on all the walls of your house. Wear it on bracelets. Do whatever you have to do until you know that you know that you know it. Okay, First Thessalonians 5, 9-11. to It says, Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. Not wonderful? You're going to live with him in heaven anyway, but uh, not only in the spiritual form, a metaphysical body, your physical one too. Then read Philippians 1, 3 to 6. You have so much homework. I'm just going to pick a little bit here at the end. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. A lot of people say that whenever they start a project, but the day is very specific. <laughs> Until the day of Christ Jesus. That's the rapture. He will complete your healing, redemptive, restorative salvation work until the rapture. Philippians 1, 9 to 10 ends here with, so that you may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Wow, another phrase that prophetically refers to the rapture. Philippians 2, 14 to 16 ends with this, hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. Again, it's another beautiful expression that refers to the rapture. Because after that, our work on earth is done. Our mandate is headed back to Israel. And the 144,000 will be picking up the heavy load. Philippians 3, 20-21 says... But we are citizens of heaven, which is why we're raptured into the heavens, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And we are eagerly waiting for him to return on the day of the rapture as our saviour. He will take our mortal bodies, which are weak, just snatch us, and change them into glorious bodies. New, improved, shining, 3D bodies fit for eternity for the world of heaven. Like his own, because he already has one using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. And that's the day of the rapture. A lot of people look at wickedness in the world now and they say, oh, God's on the throne. Jesus has it all under control. Jesus will not like what's happening on the earth today, people. He despises evil. But we have to love what's good and hate what's evil and push back evil until that day. 
and then we can put on our comfy socks and our jammies <laughs> and uh, chill out in heaven once and for all, huh? All right, another couple. Paul also wrote to his friend Timothy in a second letter that was Holy Spirit inspired. Chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. I need to put that phone on silent. This is one part of it. He searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. What is that day? It's the rapture. For the body of Christ, this is what we prophetically look forward to the most. And 2 Timothy chapter 4, 6 to 8. I'll start from the middle. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me in that day. And only, uh, not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Okay, we're not supposed to long uh, for Jesus to come back on Mount Zion with a double-edged sword and um, hacking evil people to bits and getting birds to eat them. <laughs> you know, uh, creating a portal and chucking uh, the world's prophet and the Antichrist into it. Spoiler alert. No, 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 no. No. Our excitement is the day of the rapture. And a lot of people aren't excited about it. A lot of people are absolutely terrified. No. We have been given the gospel of peace, the gospel of freedom. It's supposed to inspire faith, confidence, and deep, deep joy. So don't be afraid. You have no idea how good we have it. We are the most blessed dispensation there is, in my opinion. People are like, I want to walk in here with Jesus. I don't think you do. <laughs> because that, that requires uh, a lot of getting your act together, a lot of cupping yourself on. Which a lot of us are not very good at, myself included. But to just rest in his goodness, in his finished work, that the onus is off us. We do what we do for Jesus because we love him and to live lightly and out of thanks, but not to get anything out of him, especially salvation. We just have the best life. We are the most blessed dispensation. Don't ever forget it. And these are just some of the verses. There are probably more. Um, just to encourage you to be so, so excited for how incredible the days ahead are. And then again, I'm not saying the rapture is just around the corner. It will happen at some point in this millennium. But that, that should put excitement in your belly. It really, really should. And if you want um, another bit of prophecy, this one will require a bit more reading for you. Just read the book of Philemon. It's a nice short one. It's a book in which a bond servant or a slave had run away from his master. And Paul writes and says, okay, return to your master now as equals. Return as brothers. Return as one, one unit in unity. Philemon is the last book in the Bible um, that Paul wrote to the body of Christ. And it's not just a book that refers to a specific historical event. It's actually a book that refers to us on a prophetic level. So you're going to have a lot of prophetic teaching uh, throughout this series, I do hope. And Philemon, we are the bondservants of Christ, the slaves to righteousness. And our Lord, our Master, is Jesus. So Philemon, being the last body of Christ book in the Bible, of the bond servant returning to his master, when we return to Jesus, our work is done. Our holding of, a, a, of the mandate to evangelize the nations is complete. And uh, so the onus shifts back to the nation of Israel, first and foremost. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you learned lots and lots. As always, please do hit the like button, please subscribe, share the video to as many people as you can, to those who you think would like it, to those you think would hate it, to those you think might be somewhat interested in life, to those you have had spiritual and prophetic conversations with before. Uh, the whole world needs to hear this. 
<laughs> so uh, yeah, feel free to spread it around. And as always, you are more than welcome to leave comments below. And uh, yeah, I love reading them. And uh, if you can't think of anything spiritual to say, tell me what you had for breakfast this morning. Personally, I had chicken soup, thick chicken soup. It was really, really weird and way too watery. And I added three slices of O'Neill's Anagas and bread. <laughs> That's me. So can't wait to see you in the next one where we're going to look at space and time travel. And you might think to yourself, what the what? <laughs> I know this is a Revelation series. I assure you, Revelation will start in the episode after that. This is just to create a foundation where uh, before we get to the mad stuff of Revelation, you have a foundation where you can say, okay, prophetically, this is possible. Okay, I know where he's coming from. So yeah, space and time travel because God's good. Why not? Why not? All right. Have the best day. Slamat. And uh, see you in the next one.